Welcome back everybody, my name is Eltamar and we are going to be continuing our Let's Play of Sunless Skies. We have six port reports to give to our fatalistic signalman. Ask if he has seen enough of the reach. As you stopped at each port on your journey, the signalman spoke with other signalers. He has filled a set of dog-eared notebooks and is now collecting or collating their contents into a book. He stiffens as you approach, as if you caught him doing something he shouldn't. People outside the trade don't understand how signaling works. Every port, every corner of the sky, has its own signs and messages. It's a right mess. I've been cataloging them. The semaphores, the lamp languages, the badges and passphrases. Not that anyone will ever read it. He puts the pages into his hold-all, suddenly embarrassed. Anyway, I've been meaning to ask. Traveling has stirred up old memories. I'd like to visit a friend at London. We'll find her at Steam and Sapphire Yards. She won't remember me, but I should try. Well, that's where we're headed again anyways so we're gonna do a quick jump to london it's a little bit of a journey away we're gonna ignore the bees we actually have tons of honey because i had to kill a bunch on the way here but we're now off to london we're also going to london to see what the last stage of our well possibly last stage of our sky story is i'm willing to bet we're getting pretty close to the end of it um what we're going to do when we reach that point is not crash into the bees nest, hopefully, uh, is do some of the more exploration things. We won't do the very last part of the sky story because I don't quite want to end this captain's journey yet. Um, I just want to explore a little bit more of the Blue Kingdom and a little bit more of Eleutheria. We're not going to make, we're not going to get everything done in this game. It's just not feasible in one playthrough, fortunately. Um, just by the way the game works. Same thing with Sunless Seas, you can't do everything in one go. So what we'll do is we'll call it after we do a little bit more exploration of those couple kingdoms, and then we'll take a break, do another game of some sort, I'm not sure which one yet, but another game of some variety. And then we'll come back and do the Secrets of the Stars mission at some point in time, using the same lineage, which means it'll be easier for us in the beginning. And hopefully by the end as well, because we will have access to. I think we start with the best. I think we start with the same ship. I'm not entirely certain about that once we retire, but possibly, and the same weapons and stuff. I'm not sure if money transfers over, but you know what? We'll play it by ear. We'll see what happens. I've never done a legacy transfer that wasn't death related in this game, so we'll just have to see. Anyways, I'll be back when we get to London. We're just heading to do Winchester now to grab some supplies, and then we'll head up there. See you guys shortly. And we are back in London. We're about to talk. We have two quests to do here. First of all, we have to go visit our publisher. And second of all, we have to visit... Or we have to take our, um... Signaler to visit his friend. Just gotta figure out where to go. I guess we can go to the Sapphire Yards first. The fatalistic signalman looking up an old friend. The only address that the signalman has for his friend is Shed 4 at the yards. Unfortunately, or he'll only reveal her first name, Charlotte. Unfortunately, Shed 4 is off limits, ringed with a wire fence and under the guard of a pinched watchman and his barely tamed hounds. Well, let's trade an artifact to go in. The watchman is a hoarder with a morbid curiosity about the indigenous occupants of the high wilderness. The watchman coos at your gift and adds it to the incomprehensible jumble of objects crowding his shelves. It goes between a roll of crackling parchment, which he claims originated in the library of the scribe spinsters, and a rubbery skull. He waves you through, and the grumbling dogs watch petulantly as you sidle past. Shed 4 is a huge storehouse, beams of solemn starlight slant from grubby windows in the roof. The hulks of old locomotives rust here, from battered tugs to fat old liners once packed with emigrating Londoners. The signalman hands off, or heads off between the wrecks. Sigmund stops before a stately old wreck with flaking navy blue paint. This is her. None worked harder on the Is or Isambard line than she did. You look at the nameplate, the Charlotte guest. Ah, look how they left her, he says gloomily. That's not right. You tidy up, you put things in order, you turn the lights off and close up before you go. She deserved better than this. We can get some bronze wood and put her on display, which is what we're going to do.
Arrange for her to be put on display in a museum. Her wood is riddled with worms. Even if you can restore her, you'll need someone with influence who recommended a more lauding or lauded resting place. You'll have to source replacement wood and call in a favor you won't get back anytime soon, but you secure the promise you need. The Charlotte guest will be restored and displayed in a modest exhibition hall, a modest exhibition hall in the Museum of Inauguration, where London commemorates its arrival in the skies. The plaque she receives will not mention the is Zimbard line. London does not celebrate failures, but it will testify to her hard work in a hostile sky. The signalman is mollified. It's all any best can hope for in the end, isn't it? To be remembered. Let's visit the stalwart bookkeeper. He occupies a tiny smoky office cobbled together from the corrugated iron sheets in the back of one of the engine sheds. Oh, this is the new street line. We don't care too much about that right now. Uh, we need to figure out where our publisher went. Oh, there it is. Ambition Song of the Sky. The Song of the Sky looms in your mind. Half-finished monument. You arrive at the publisher's new office, a gleaming building with an elevator, a courtyard, and an honest-to-goodness water feature. The omnivorous publisher strides down to meet you, followed by a platoon of assistants, lawyers, bodyguards, and hangers-on. There's my star, he cries, his hand clammily finding yours. Let me show you around. He takes you on a tour of his new office, dwelling particularly on the new presses, very modern, and the life-size portraits of himself. Quite an excellent likeness, yes? When finished, he claps your shoulder and offers you the decaying approximation of a smile. Our hard work is really paying off, he says. I think it's time you saw a share of the profits. Now tell me, where's the next canto? We need to write the sixth. We need a momentous exploit, apparently. Speak to the omnivorous publisher. He assures you that in order to break through London market, you need to write about something, or write about another of your more famed exploits. The publisher leans back amid a halo of smoke. Imagine I'm the average man on the streets, by which I mean a philistine of the lowest order. What have you done lately to capture my attention? We've explored the Boatman, another one of the legendary wrecks. The publisher listens to your story wrapped, and when you're finished, he takes a moment to clear his throat, reshuffle the papers on his desk. Very good, he says. And finally, extraordinary, in fact. We'll write the sixth canto of the song in the sky. Your writing will need to be a novel and enticing if you hope to delight the more experienced palates of London. We got 15,000 experience, which is worthless for us. The city bustles outside your window, paying you very little mind. It's liberating somehow to be in a city where you're relatively unknown. In New Winchester, the weight of expectation was crushing. Here, the indifference feels like freedom. As you contemplate the blank page, awaiting inspiration, you realize that throughout the course of the song you've written of your crew only when necessary. Perhaps now's the time to tell their stories in more detail, or are they just going to remain your supporting cast? Our crew are important, we've lost thousands of them, maybe not, maybe like a hundred. It is decided, in addition to depicting your most recent exploits, the sixth canto will delve into the stories of your crew. You are careful to get their permission first, of course. At this point, a role of prominence in the Song of the Sky has the potential to bring unwelcome attention from readers, critics, journalists, and other reprobates. A moment of hesitation and then the dam bursts in your mind. Words flood the page and carry you forward in an irresistible current. So you are flung into an ending as though dashed upon rocks. The result is rushed and imperfect. Grimly you go back, you knock the story down and rebuild it, brick by painstaking brick, working with nihilistic fury of a master blacksmith reforging his own guillotine. Finally, just as you're ready to throw your entire manuscript into the fire, you realize you no longer need to. There's nothing left to fix. The sixth canto is complete. The omnivorous publisher sends a lackey to collect your manuscript. The publisher is attending some very important parties promoting your work. Says the assistant, tucking the sixth canto beneath her arm without reading it. He sends his apologies. Let's investigate the publisher's office. You haven't heard any word of the canto's publication, and you haven't been abducted by the publisher for another book tour. Has something gone wrong? As you approach the publisher's London office, you spot a thin plume of smoke. It is a charred ruin. You ask one of the surrounding policemen what happened. We came to close the place down by the order of the Ministry of Public Decency. Publication of subversive materials, you see, the constable waves, something that you recognize as the sixth canto. When we got here, the publisher fought back, gunfire was exchanged, said he'd burn the place to the ground before he paid taxes, which was funny because we weren't there for taxes. What happened to him? The constable, or what happened to him? The constable shrugs. On the run, we'll find him. 
You must find a way to publish the sixth canto in defiance of the Ministry of Public Decency. Well, we could just set up our own printing press. We have tons of money. Set up an underground uh, printing press for the Song of the Sky. If you can't be published legitimately, you'll distribute a sixth canto illicitly across London. Let them try to stop you. You hire some assistance of dubious character, buy your own printing press, and make a few well-judged bribes. Once the press is set up and running, in an abandoned warehouse, you start distributing copies of the Sixth Canto for free. The paper is thin as tissue and the ink smudges at a touch, but it spreads across London like a particularly virulent plague. The controversy only heightens the interest. Soon the Sixth Canto is so universally popular from working men's clubs to factory floors that the Ministry is forced to admit defeat and lift the ban to avoid further embarrassment. Now we need to write the final Song of the Sky Canto. We need two unlicensed charts, we only have one. We need one more moment of inspiration, and we need three visions of the heavens. We have all of the otherworldly artifacts we need. We have a captivating treasure, we have one searing enigma, and we have a bunch of savage secrets. We can't lose any of these things, so we need three things to complete this. I don't know where we're going to get them yet, but we're going to figure that out a little bit later. For now, though, we're going to go talk to our signaler, because I'm sure he has things that he wants to discuss with us. I'm also just going to move my microphone just a tiny bit. There we go. Alright, signaler time. His mustache is stained with nicotine. His isambard line uniform is neatly pressed. He always expects the worst, confident in the knowledge that he will still be disappointed. Oh, I don't want to lose any savage secrets. We need those savage secrets. I guess we can get more somehow. Where did I even get the savage secrets I had? Oh well. He laps up your stories like a cat would cream. In return he shares a story of his own. Came to the skies as a lad in the first days. Her majesty needed a whole country built and granted us 30 years to do it. I took the offer, helped lay the foundation of London, built some of the dome over the throne of the hours. And then I joined up with the squire to lay the Isambard line and headed to the reach. The last time I saw Albion, it were just construction. I'd like to take a look around, see what our craft brought. We need five Albion port reports. Which we don't have yet. How many Albion port reports do we currently have? I know we have some. Purian is not in Albion. Neither is Aklas. We have none. Okay, well, I guess our goal now is to go ahead and get more port reports. So we're going to do a little tour. We're going to go Mausoleum, Work World, Perdurance, Floating Parliament, Clockwork Sun. What was that one again? Oh, that's the Avid Horizon, right. We're still missing one area from here as well. It's supposed to be down in this area. Maybe we'll go to Mausoleum, this place. Whatever is down here, Perdurance Floating Parliament, that's what we'll do. Okay, we are going to head out. I'll be back shortly after we've accumulated, well, at least some of our um, port reports. And then also when we find our new dock somewhere to the south southwest, apparently. Back shortly. We have arrived at the Royal Society. Pretty mansions of stone and glass arise above the verdant gardens, while below machines whir and groan. A persistent sound of hammering pounds through the air. Mr. Menagerie is here, but that's not important. The Celestial Exhibition. To the delight of mostly himself, the mellifluous president is planning an exhibition in the Royal Society. His theme will be the science of the skies. He's happy to pay visiting captains for the items of interest they might come across. We can donate a bunch of different things, but we aren't going to do any of those. The Royal Society itself. The words Nilius in Verba are written across the stonework above the great bronze wood do or doors. Her renewed majesty has granted these grounds to the finest minds in Albion to work here. Their purview is to invent, to hypothesize, and to discover, and most crucially, to watch the stars. Let's introduce ourselves at the Airy House. An offer of work. The mellifluous president greets you. He directs your attention to the new marble on the floors, to the cheerful portraits of distinguished Royal Society members lining the hallway, and finally to a very large portrait of himself in his plush library. We do like captains here at the Royal S. We need our space and, frankly, our comforts to think. 
But it is you brave souls who do the real legwork. Extremely educational. If not, our gardens are extremely fine, as is our conversation and the port. We can... Try and tame the gardens. Why not? We failed with an 80% chance of grim. We gained 5 terror. Time passed. We're going to write a port report, because that's really what we're here for, mostly. And we're going to go take a look at Nell's Tower. The Royal Society Observatory is named for King Charles' canniest mistress. Nell's Tower is the jewel in the Society's crown. A sign on the door in neat copper plate reads, Nell's Tower, closed for the 13th annual Airy Dinner. Leave urgent business at the doorstep. There's a polite cough at your shoulder, turning you see a tall man with a beard like a nest of vipers. The supercilious bursar introduces himself. I came to round up stragglers, but as a captain, you are of rank sufficient to attend dinner if you wish to attend. Sure, why not? Let's go. The dinner is held at the mahogany and marble imperial dining room of Airy House. Every piece of the di or dinner service is mismatched, and both the furniture and the personages in the room are pleasantly rumpled. The supercilious bursar brings you to the high table, where three senior astronomers of Nell's Tower are holding court. You are introduced to the senatorial professor, the chair for the efful effulgent sciences, and the lecturer for imperial affairs as the first course is served. Conversation. We'll eavesdrop. Oh, we got a sky story. I was hoping for a savage secret. The supercilious bursar keeps everyone's poor glasses well topped up as the conversation descends into fractitious, fractious bickering. The disagreement centers around the orientation of the society's great telescope. The lecturer wishes its gaze outwards beyond the borders of Albion, while the chair desired it to be turned on Albion's territories. The first course ends with a great smacking of lips and a general feeling of goodwill towards the chef. Now we can talk to some people. The supercilious bursar passes the dish of buttered potatoes with an oily smile. The conversation continues, lubricated by Herculean quantities of port. Buttered potatoes, roast squirmings, and sautéed hybrian mushrooms are devoured between rhetorical thrusts. Let's talk to the... Chair for the Effulgent Sciences. Her eyes are wild, she has savaged the potatoes, her conversation rambles, but her language is poetry. She interrupts you repeatedly to make this point or that. At first, these feel these feel like random interjections, but by the end, she is refuting points you made at the start of the course and anticipating your jokes with wild-eyed delight. I've always been in love with the heavens, is all the biography you get from her, however. The second course ends with the lecturer in Imperial Affairs telling a rather ribald joke and a hearty toast to the continued health of all present. Sherbet's produced in London sweet shops, and sponge cake from the Admiral Nelson on Port Prosper, clotted cream, and actual strawberries grown in the gardens, or port. The conversation grows looser. The story is more risque. The supercilious bursar leans in conspiratorially. I arrange these dinners to promote unity, you understand, and of course for the good memory of our previous president, who nobly argued for the introduction of the society to the wilderness, and convinced Her Majesty of our utility. He toasts the large portrait of Airy that dominates the room. Let's talk to the chair again. She's drawing something on that napkin. Are those limbs? Rays? She smiles widely. Something I saw last time I was permitted to use our great scope. Honestly, what's the point if we have to ask permission every time we move it? Did Isaac Newton need King Charlie's permission to discover gravity? The third course comes to a close with a great groaning and heartfelt but false protestations that one couldn't possibly manage cheese and biscuits after all this. The supercilious bursar leans in as the plates are cleared away. Before we adjourn, there is a question of patronage to consider. All eyes are on you. A hush falls over the table. The three faces of the astronomers are turned to you. The supercilious bursar continues as though nothing has changed. Our telescope is operated only by the goodwill of the government. We are not allowed to move the telescope without permission. A bold skyfarer such as yourself might obtain such permission, or at least an official looking document that could be conceivably construed, construed as permission. Our astronomers would be very much interested in patronizing you. You will bring them a permit, they can advance their research in exchange, they'll teach you what they know. Let's teach the effulgent sciences. I like her, she's cool. She lets out a high laugh to wild as the shrieks of the bat-winged curators that ride the celestial winds. I'll show you such things, Captain. Come to the tower, do, and make sure you have a permit. Sure, why not? We have ministry strap stamped permits.
We can observe the clockwork sun. London authorizes and encourages this use of the telescope. The Ministry has sent permits for this particular usage up to the next century, the Bursar informs you. We gained one terror. The sun's light is thin and nauseous, plucking the horizon with a poisonous white gold light. Looking closer, you can see the machinery around the sun is still. Half lies in darkness, the other half in a sad semi twilight. We'll deliver the chair permission to move the telescope. Ascent to the telescope is arduous and up an improbable number of winding stone steps. At the top waits the telescope, gargantuan and gleaming as a dragon slumbering in its lair. The chair pulls the machinery to open the dome to the heavens with visible glee. For a few moments, she stands alone, looking up and bathed in distant starlight. And then she's at the telescope, lowering the great barrel until the lens is at her eye. Hmm. Let's read the reports. On the desk for our perusal. A small measure of progress was achieved. I fixed the telescope firmly on the horizon, as I had indicated previous. Much must be left to speculation, but I believe there are commonalities with my observances at Port Avon. A different intent for sure, but one must wonder, for how long have our microscopic activities been under the lens of minds immeasurably superior to our own? I guess that's it for now. We'll come back later, I suppose. The Rochester Club. The clubhouse. Brandy glasses gleam on the shelves. We can compete in a race. The thundering terror of the sunless skies. The Rochester races are the competitive sport of choice at the Royal Society. Why not? Lord Rochester claps you on the back. Good sport, that. The rules are simple. Get to the destination port and back here in 30 days. Then you can call yourself a true Rochester racer. Savvy? He calls... For order in the club room and gathers the other racers around. A quick toast is raised to your health and then it's on with the race. Reach floating parliament and return to the Rochester club within 30 days. We should probably get going then. We'll get to this later. They want unseasoned hours here. I didn't bring them any. Whoops. Okay, floating parliament and back. We can do that. Maybe we can even stop them for endurance. Probably shouldn't have started our trip by smashing into the dock, but whatever. Alright, so we're gonna go straight to Perdurance and then we're gonna go grab a port report, hit Parliament, and then we should be fine. It's the 2nd of April, so we have till May 2nd, approximately. How many days does April have? 30 days. So by May 2nd, we should be back. I can already hear Parliament's bells. Oh yeah, we're supposed to be a member of Parliament as well. I did sort of forget that. It's the 3rd of April already. How's our path going? We're doing fine. It's getting late though, for real. It's going to be time for bed soon. As soon as we hit these last two little areas, we'll call it an eve. Get to bed, get some sleep. I have no idea what time it even is at the moment. Should probably have been to bed a while ago at that rate. That's okay though. It is my only video today. I was very busy today and I just didn't have time to do videos as much as I wanted to. Ooh. How close are we now? It's the 4th of April. We've only been sailing for two days. This is not going to be a very difficult task, I don't think. Grab a quick port report and perdurance, and we are off. Hit up floating parliament, and then basically straight back. All the way to the Royal Society. We can also talk to our good friend, the signaler, to see what's next on his quest line.
Maybe don't slam into the uh, light buoy. It's still the 4th of April. We're doing wonderful for time. Oh, it's the 5th of April. Oh no. Okay. Take the parlor. Report. Done. We're out of here. Flip Perdurance. I'm sure they appreciated the ship smashing into what looks like a greenhouse or like an arboretum type thing. Yeah, we're just going to ram that with our ship. I'm sure that won't cause any sort of damage. We do have a star-maddened person chasing us, but I just don't have time to face off against him. Although he's not going to leave us alone, I don't think. Alright, fine. We hit him with some guns. He's coming up behind us. Still coming at us, though. We're almost in Parliament. We just have to stay away from him for a little bit longer. Oh, great, that's exactly what I needed. A crystalline dreadnought, too. Deranged dreadnought. The skies are a dangerous place, I do have to say. There is no denying that fact. Hooray, we've arrived in Parliament. We're not going to do our MP stuff today. We are just going to grab the port report. You are signaler quest thing why are there so many people that hate me in the skies right now jesus just got hit by a tackety ship but we are here so um people's professional protest we can recruit crew from the protest actually three crew nice palace or report it's the 7th of April, we're okay. Find the race marshal. Lord Rochester is, pro is propping himself up at the estranged bar. He needs to confirm you've reached for a floating parliament. Our terror has reduced weekend to supply. Lord Rochester regards you with bleary-eyed delight. How sensational, he prays, with a rather... with rather more S's than her usual. Jolly glad you made it. Care for a tipple? He shakes his head. No, no, you must be on your way. He waves you back to your engine, but not before thrusting a few bottles into your arms for the return leg. There is more supplies, but there's no fuel here, and we only have four fuel, so we gotta be kinda careful. They apparently want a lot of souls here. Oh no, this is for us to buy. I don't want to buy souls, I'm fine. Undock. We're gonna back out of port. It's probably faster. Just swing around, and then we are off. Uh, we can do our Christmas, though. Ask about his opinion of Albion. You've traveled across the region together. Has he seen enough? The signalman pauses in transcribing his latest set of notes. They cover the signals of Albion from the bat-delivered memos, memos of Parliament to the archaic systems of the Home Office. His manuscript grows ever heftier. It's not the world we thought we was building. Looks like a lot like the old one. For a start, but with brighter gleams and darker glooms, he frowns. We're all afraid to let go of what was. Speaking of, when we next stop at London, they like to take a shore leave. It's time I spoke to the squire. Who's that, you ask? Purveyor of follies, he responds obliquely. All right, off to London next. Go away, ship. I'm busy. I have to make it back in time. I don't know why exactly, but I do. All right, we're going to do a quick jump cut to when we arrive there. Looks like that ship's on the verge of death. Should probably... Oh, Jesus. Ow. 
it's not on the verge of death, it just took a fairly substantial amount of punishment from us with very little damage. And now we are in its gun sights. Super. Stupid enemy ship, leave me alone. Ooh, we can get in glass. You kind of missed Cantankery, I'm sorry. I'm going to shoot you in the face. I warned him. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. There was no lies. Anyways, back shortly. And we are back at the Royal Society. We're going to turn in our Rochester Club thing. We definitely made it in time. We have triumphed. Victory is ours. 500 sovereigns in the bank. I don't really think we need to do another race, though, to be honest. Let's go to Portsmouth House. The workshops under Airy are known collectively as Portsmouth House. The glass and brick factories are staffed by harassed inventors and engineers working constantly to reduce the next advancement in adventure equipment. Let's go see the workshops. We can repair our hull, which needs experimental modifications. Let's not do that. Let's talk to the engineers. Perhaps they'll be willing to furnish our locomotive with advanced equipment. We can trade cargo in cargo items for unique equipment for our locomotive. The senior engineer marches across the smoggy workshop floor to meet you. Well, she barks, sorry, I mean hello, we're frightfully busy. We've been examining the effects of vitrification on Murgatroyd's tea. We just had a breakthrough. There's a gentle explosion behind her, followed by the tinkle of shattering glass. Sorry, mustache. Do visit the arsenal if you're looking for something special. All right, let's visit the inscribed tinker. Oh, she wants a re she has a request. Um, we just go to the no. Okay, let's go back to Portsmouth House. Oh wait, let's go to the arsenal. That's what we need. The Portsmouth Arsenal. We can purchase unique locomo locomotive equipment. We can contribute specimens, of which we have a billion of, so we could probably do that a bunch of times. Or even otherworldly artifacts, which we also have just tons of. Apparently stained glass stuff. Okay, anyways, let's figure this out. What can we get? We can acquire the Rosetti Cabins, which are... We need 25 hearts to start with, but it's armor 8, quarters 2, which is fine. The Mighty Pen Defensive Library System need hearts 25, increases armor by 5 and hold by 4. The mechanical Turk he is a chess player, I guess? I don't know, whatever. It's an auxiliary slot, it needs veils 25, increases hold and hidden compartments by 1. Mining and smelting array, veils 25, increases hold by 4, and is also a mining thing. Carmilla is a cannery. Okay. Really what we want is like the bigger, badder ones. So we need 50 veils for the Montessori chamber. Holden quarters by 4. We don't have enough modifications. The other one is veils 75. Increases armor and by 13 and quarters by 5. Which is actually not that great. Not really what we need. So we don't really have anything we want here. Hmm. Kind of sad about that, but whatever. Let's go to the workshops. Let's visit the Tinker. She has something for us to do. What is it? If it's work you're after, I could be of assistance. The correspondence, Captain. The incandescent language. The Pentecostal tongues of the stars. She invites you to examine the broken sigils that score her skin mirrored in her notebook. I think I found a unique sigil I've never, never come across before. It's been cited by students in Trader's Wood, by an old friend of the mausoleum, and by my least favorite person in Pan. As a captain, you can get to those places and confirm the sighting. Give you access to a few of my unique designs should you wish to help. Maybe we get more designs the more we do these things. But anyways, we need to go to London. But we're going to call it a video here. I think we're done for the night. It is sleep o'clock for me. And we'll get started bright and early tomorrow. Like always, if you have any suggestions or comments, please leave them below. Otherwise, I'll see you all next time.